Well, good morning again, church. I'm Mike Ortiz. Uh, I serve here at Canaan as uh, a worship leader as well as uh, in the children's ministry with Awana. Our scripture reading this morning is from 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 16. Will you please stand and uh, offer the reading of God's holy word? For you, for you yourselves know, brothers, that our coming to you was not in vain. But though we had already suffered and been shamefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we had boldness in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in the midst of such conflict. For our appeal does not spring from error or impunity or any attempt to deceive, but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, not to please man, but to please God who tests our hearts. For we never come with words of flattery, as you know, nor with pretext for greed. God is witness. Nor did we speak or did, did we seek glory from people, neither from you or from others, though we could have demand uh, we could have made such demands as apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. So, being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to uh, to share with you not only the gospel of God but also our own selves, because you had become very dear to us for you remember brothers our labor and toil we worked night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you while we proclaim to you the gospel of god you are witnesses and god also how holy and righteous and blameless was our conduct towards you believers for you know how like a father with his children we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and and charged you to uh, walk in a manner worthy of God, who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. And we also thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it as the word of, uh, you, you did not accept it as word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. For you brothers became imitators of the churches of God in Christ. Christ Jesus, that we are, uh, or that were in Judea, for you suffered the same things from your own countrymen as they did from the Jews, who killed both the Lord Jesus and the prophets, and drove us out and displeased God and opposed all mankind by hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles that they may be saved. So as always, to fill up the measure of their sin, but wrath has come upon them at last. This is the word of the Lord. Yeah. Please be seated. Thank you, Mike. All right. Well, good morning again. Good to see all of you. Uh, thanks for being here today. Uh, thanks for joining us online, those of you that are doing that. Um, so we're continuing our series uh, on holiness matters most. It's really the theme of the entire book of First Thessalonians. So we are just systematically going through the book of First Thessalonians and, and seeing what God has for us and for the church. And we begin this last Sunday as we looked at chapter one and and in chapter one, Paul really kind of lifted up the Thessalonian church as an exemplary church. This is a church that he wanted the other churches to emulate. And we talked about last week how this is really good timing for us because, you know, there's, the church is kind of in crisis mode here in the United States. Uh, been in pretty sharp decline over the last 50 years. And um, a lot of churches have gotten away from the Bible as being the word of God. And we're, we talked a lot of statistics last week about just how with every generation, there's fewer and fewer members of that generation coming to faith in Jesus Christ. And so we're just, we need a model. We need an ex example. We need, we want to follow Jesus. And as a church, we want to be like the churches that the Bible says, are these are good, solid churches. And so Thessalonians, the Thessalonians are, are one such church. And so that's kind of where we began this whole uh, series last week and you know it's, it's exciting though it's exciting that the church is still the church and the church is still doing what God's called us to do and you know this past week on Thursday night we had the the Bethlehem Christian Academy gala and uh, some of you went to that 
But it was just really awesome just to see all the people that God is using to bring the gospel to the nations, you know, and just hear stories about children's lives changed and hear stories about through a school, two schools in Zambia, there's so many churches that have started through, um, through our work as, a, as Canaan and Senegal, now through also Bethlehem Christian Camp. Just, there's so many churches that have been started and people coming to Jesus and getting baptized. And that awesome to be a part of stuff like that where God's doing things all over the planet. And it's exciting. And, and so uh, we raised money this past Thursday night for, for, for more work, gospel work to be done. So that's good. There's a lot of great things about the church. The church is God's idea. So it's a great idea. But as we're going to talk today, um, we're going to kind of unpack more about this, the, the church, not only in Thessalonica, but just the church in general. And so um, based on the passage that, uh, that Mike read, just keep your Bible open there, the first Thessalonians chapter two. Because here's the, here's the big thought. The big thought has to do with this pursuit of holiness, right? We're talking about holiness matters most. Here's what I don't want you to hear throughout this series, is that holiness, is that our pursuit of holiness is an effort to try to get God to do something for us, right? It's not, we're not pursuing holiness to attain something, okay? We're not pursuing righteousness to attain something. We pursue righteousness, we pursue holiness because we already have something, right? And that something is Jesus, you know? So this is a, this is a, a big truth that underlines this whole concept of, of holiness and, and righteousness and blamelessness, which kind of terms that, that Paul uses in interchangeably some, especially in this chapter. Um, this isn't like, we're not trying to be holy so God might accept us, right? God accepts us based on Jesus. Amen? So here, here's, here's the bottom line up front as far as that goes, right? When Jesus died on the cross, there's this amazing thing that happened. When Jesus died on the cross, what he did is he took from you your sin and your shame. Just think about those horrible moments in your life when you like wish you could crawl under a rock or wish you would stayed in bed that day or, you know, wish you could fly a thousand miles away. Remember that old Southwest commercial, want to get away? Remember those moments in your life when you, you did those things, right? You're like, oh, how can, I, how can I look these people in the eye or whatever? Jesus took all of that and he bore that on the cross. And at the same moment, he also in turn, the, the big theology word is imputed. He placed his righteousness into your account, so to speak. So that now when God looks at you, those of us who have faith in Jesus, he doesn't see your yuck and sin. He sees the righteousness of Jesus. I mean, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 sums it up like this. He, the Father, made him the Son who knew no sin to become our sin so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So, when I say we're talking about pursuing holiness and righteousness, I'm not talking about doing these things in order to try to get God to like you. Hey, God loves you right now in the midst of your yuck, in the midst of whatever you got going on in life, right? Romans chapter five says this, that God demonstrates his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So right now, if you're in the middle of a pornographic addiction, hey, God loves you. Right now, if you're spending money left and right that you don't have, God loves you. Right now, if you have betrayed your best friend, you're trying to figure that out, hey, God loves you. Isn't that amazing? This is the God that we get to know and love, be loved by. This is the God that saves us, that Michaela's following and so many of us are following. Why do we follow this God? And why do we follow this person, Jesus Christ? Because he loves us, he died for us, and he rose again from the grave, defeating all that mess, right? That's why we follow this Jesus, because he's, he's amazing. He's, he's God, he's God the Son, and he loves us deeply, he wants that relationship with us. And so we're talking about pursuing holdings, we're talking about pursuing a lifestyle that reflects what we already have. Does that, does that make sense? That's what we're talking about. So as we pursue the pleasure of God and through holiness, we will, here's some things that will happen. We'll share the gospel, people will be saved, and we will deeply savor our partnership that we have with one another. That's what we're going to see in this particular text. So let's, let's just dive right in. Number one, 
We please God as we share his gospel out of love, not out of obligation, not out of just sense of duty, but out of love. To love others, to love Jesus is to share the gospel. So some things we see about this gospel. We first see the gospel belongs to God. It is God's gospel. Look at what Paul calls it every time in this passage. We see this, he says, for you yourselves know brothers that our coming to you is not in vain. They didn't do it in vain. They, they came to share the gospel. It was the whole purpose of their trip. The whole purpose in going to Thessalonica was to share the gospel. But though we had already suffered and been shamefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we had boldness in our God to declare to you the gospel of God. Gospel of God. That means the gospel is all about God. The gospel is not about you and me. In fact, as we talk about holiness, as we talk about this whole book, that's one of the sub-themes is it's not about you and me, it's all about God, right? And so you know what we're going to do, we do it all the time. Just turn to your neighbor and say, it's not about you. Not about you. Yep. Some of you are like, man, I thought I could never tell her that. Not about you. It's all about God. Everything about our life, everything about our church, everything about ministry, everything about our careers. Ultimately, it's all about God. Paul and his companions, it was all about God for them. That's why they even went to Thessalonica. We looked at that backstory last week in Acts chapter 17. When they get to Thessalonica and begin to share the gospel, after they just got beat up and kicked out of Philippi, they traveled on down and they were so intentional. That's because they knew it was about God. And secondly, because God had entrusted them and he entrusts us with the gospel. Let's just read on and, and see what, what, what else Paul says. For our appeal does not spring from error or impurity or any attempt to deceive. But just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. That's huge. And trust me, think of entrusting someone, right? You think, of, you think of something that you have, that maybe it's a precious possession, maybe a family heirloom. You know, I know we got in our family this really old violin, right? It was my great, great grandfather's or something like that, right? Back in the 1800s, I mean, it's got like um, the pearl inlay ivory bow. And I mean, it's, I don't know how much it's worth, but it's a very precious thing in our family. <clears throat> so, my mom decided to entrust me with that violin. That's a lot of pressure, you know, because, you know, I, I've got seven kids and, you know, with kids, this, when you, here's what I was told when we first got, started having kids. When you have a lot of kids, that's all you have. <laughs> right? You don't have anything else. It all gets messed up, damaged, whatever. And now I got this, this precious family heirloom violin, you know, and so that's a lot of pressure. But uh, that's what we think of, we think of this concept of entrusting something to someone, something valuable, something precious. I'm going to entrust it to you. Well, here God has entrusted Paul and he entrusts us with the gospel. And if you go right back up, why? Because we have been approved by God. It's huge. So if you're a follower of Jesus, then you have been approved and entrusted with this precious gift. And here's how Paul describes this precious gift in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. He says, we have this what? treasure. We have this treasure. We're in jars of clay. We're brittle. We're fragile, right? We, but still, God has entrusted, placed this treasure within us to show that it's not about us, right? Not the surpassing power. It belongs to God, not to us. Again, it's all about God. So we have this incredible treasure of the gospel entrusted to us. So as a result, what do we do? We declare it. We declare the gospel, and that's what Paul says here. He says, so just as we have been approved and entrusted with this gospel, we speak, not to please men, it's not about us, but to please God who tests our hearts, right? So we declare, to verbally declare. And there comes a point in time in your relationships, your friendships, and all of us have people we know, all of us have people we know and love who don't know Jesus yet. This is for all of us, right? The greatest thing you can do is to share the gospel. As, um, there's, there's this show called Penn and Teller. Anybody familiar with Penn and Teller? Yeah, they kind of had like different illusionists come in or whatnot, watch them, and they're like, oh, you did that, and, you know, it was really up your sleeve and all that fun stuff, right? Well, well, Penn, uh, Penn goes on um, one of his own little personal YouTube things, and he's just kind of a, a monologue, but he, he's talking about an experience that happened to him after one of his shows. Now, Penn is an ardent atheist. I mean, he is 
very vocal. I wouldn't call him hostile, but he is just very rigid and firm in his atheism. He does not believe in God. He does not believe in heaven or hell, anything like that. But he's talking about this event that happened after one of his shows. He comes out of his show and he's, he's a real big guy, you know, and tall. And anyway, he, he, he sees over in the corner while he's signing autographs, this guy's just kind of waiting for him. And so after he's kind of done, the, the guy approaches and this guy gives him a lot of compliments. And Penn tells it, this, he's, he's a really good guy, just really genuine. Really honest, he likes his show. He likes how we do things. He likes our honesty, really appreciates that. You know, you can tell he was really genuine. And then Penn says, and then this guy, he, he, he hands me, he says, I've got a gift for you. I just want you to have it. I know no strings attached. I know you don't believe, but here's just something that I just want to give you. And it was a Gideon's Bible, a little pocket Bible from the Gideons. Y'all know those? It's like New Testament Psalms, Proverbs, right? And, and you can tell that the pen's not into the Christian world much because he says, you know, it's, a, it's, it's a Bible, New Testament, it says, with Psalms and Proverbs. And Psalms and Proverbs, they're part of the New Testament, right? No, not. But anyway, he thought the worst. Anyway, but he got this Bible. And he's, and he's just really blown away by the, the kindness of this guy that just gave him the Bible. And here's what Penn said. He said, I really appreciated that. Because, you know, I don't believe in heaven and hell, but if I did, I would tell as many people as I could because that's, that's really important, right? If you believe that heaven and hell is real, I mean, and here's what he said, how much you have to hate someone to not tell them about heaven and hell and about the gospel. That just really stuck with me. That really one of the most hateful things we can do to someone is to not tell them about Jesus who loves them, who died for them, to rescue them from this reality of hell so they can ha live in the reality of heaven forever. Amen? And here's an atheist schooling us on that, right? It's really powerful. So we declare the gospel, again, out of love, not out of obligation, not out of guilt, but because we experience how good Jesus is. We experience how he changes us. And so we just want to. And as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, let the love of Christ compel us. And so we should be compelled. And so we, you know, again, 2 Corinthians 4, Paul says, we proclaim, what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord. And then lastly, we don't just declare it, we live it. We live the gospel out. Again, this is where what we say and what we do need to be close as, as close as possible the same, right? Now, there's no perfect churches. There's no perfect people. We are all sinners saved by the grace of God. Even when you become saved and follow Jesus, you still have this sinful flesh. It still has fleshly desires. And that's where you kind of see the apostle Paul. He does his routine in Romans 7, starting verse 13. He says, I don't understand what I do because what I want to do, I don't do. But what I hate, I end up doing it, right? You know, everybody identify with that? Yep. And so he talks about this, this constant struggle, right? In his spirit, he wants to honor the Lord. He wants to obey. He wants to do the right things. But man, in his flesh, he, he wants to just honor himself and he wants to satisfy his flesh and just all this constant spiritual struggle that's going on. That is real, you know? And so as followers of Jesus, because we've been declared holy and righteous in Jesus, we're to, to strive to live out that holiness in us, which is to live the gospel. And we get here to, to verse 10. You know, and he says, you are witnesses in God also how holy and righteous and blameless was our conduct toward you believers. Part of why Paul and his companions were so successful in communicating the gospel of Jesus to the Thessalonians to begin with is because they were living what they taught, right? They didn't just say it and go do something else. Their speech and their behavior was together. It's called integrity. The word integrity comes from the um, word integer. Everybody remember algebra? Ooh. <laughs> remember integers? Who remembers the word but has no idea what it is? All right, yeah, that's good. Well, an integer is any whole number, whole. The word is whole, right? So if you have integrity, you're whole. It means what you believe, what you say, and what you do is one. That's integrity. And so that's what, that's what we strive to do because we all reflect to Jesus. So, but we tell the gospel, we share the gospel love. Secondly, we please God as we receive the gospel as his word, as his word. 
And so here he's going to really brag on them, right? He, he goes on, he says, we never came with words of flattery, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed. So there's more of their integrity that's coming out. Nor do we seek glory from people, whether from you or from others, though we could have made demands as apostles. We were gentle among you like nursing mothers. So being affectionately desirous, we're going to come back to, come back to that. They shared the gospel, right? And so we get to here to verse nine. For you remember, brothers, our labor and toil, we worked night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you while we proclaimed to you the gospel of God. And you are witnesses and God also. It goes on more about their integrity. But then he's gonna talk about how they received the word. Verse, verse um, 13, we also thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God. So there was this recognition that as Paul and his companions preached the gospel, they heard this. Now, you know, these, these are not just these guys' ideas. This, there's something to this, right? This is God's word. It's the, it's the recognition, it's the discernment that what we have today, this right here, these are not just what over 40 different authors wrote down over a period of 1500 years. This is all is actually inspired by God. That's what this means, right? If this is God's word, this is God inspired. Like we read in 2 Timothy 3, 16, all scripture is breathed out by God, right? You see like in, in 2 Peter chapter one, right? How no prophet ever spoke of their own interpretation, but wrote as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. This is inspiration. This is means we believe that God superintended, the Holy Spirit superintended the entire process of the scriptures coming about, right? Yes, Paul wrote and he wrote in his own experience. He wrote in his own style, but God was superintending that process. That's what we believe about inspiration. And since this is inspired by God, it means it carries the authority of God. And the authority of scripture means that we understand and we read scripture that to disbelieve and disobey any word of scripture is the same thing as disobeying or disbelieving God himself, right? That when we read this word, this is God's word. It is from God. So when these Thessalonians first heard the word, they understood, hey, this is from God. I'm submitting myself and trusting, which is what salvation is all about. Submitting yourself and trusting, confessing Jesus is Lord. That is submitting ourselves and trusting him, right? Trust, faith, saying those are synonyms. So this is what the foundation of our faith is the word as the word of God. And so these early Thessalonians, man, they, they knew this. They weren't just, oh, this is good philosophy. Oh, this is just good ideas. No, they went beyond that. This is the word of God. And folks, there's just so much evidence, so much that we could do a series on this, probably have before, that, that shows that this, the word of God is authentic, it's historical, it's very accurate, right? We have so much archeological evidence, historical evidence that substantiates that what you read, what we just read in 1 Thessalonians chapter two, right? If you went back to the year 130 AD and you read it, it'd be exactly the same. We have that kind of evidence as opposed to like Roman history. You ever heard of Julius Caesar, Mark Antony, Cleopatra, right? Heard all these figures from Roman history, right? Et tu Brute, anybody know what that means? And you Brutus, right? William, where did William Shakespeare get all that stuff, right? From Roman history. Where do we have Roman history from? <clears throat> Two primary sources. And the evidence for the authenticity and historicity of that Roman history is nowhere close to the history and evidence we have substantiating the Bible. But yet today, even a lot of public libraries, where do you find the Bible? In the fiction section. Why is that? Well, because there's this bias against the supernatural. See, the Gallic War is one source of Roman history, or Tacitus, another source of Roman history. They don't talk about Julius Caesar walking on water. You know? They don't talk about um, Augustus Caesar, Caesar healing the blind or raising the dead. They were military leaders, they were kings and emperors, but they didn't do supernatural stuff. There's just this bias against the supernatural, right? And so they say they, they read the gospels and see Jesus healing people, walking on water, say, oh, that could have never happened. 
because men can't do that. So they throw it in the fiction. And you know, if Jesus was just a man, that's kind of rational. But did Jesus claim to be just a man? No, he's also God the Son. He is God himself, God in the flesh. Is it irrational to believe that God can heal someone? Is it irrational that God can defy the very natural laws that he created and in place? That's very rational. Absolutely. So shame on them for putting in fiction because we know this is the true, authoritative, inspired word of God. And so we receive the word, right? I mean, Paul says in in Romans chapter 10, verse 17, we must hear the word of God because he says faith comes by hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. So that, and you get to, to Paul's process in Romans chapter 10. If faith comes with hearing, but how can they believe if they have not heard? How can they hear if it is not preached? And how can they preach if they are not sent? That kind of shows the whole process of how we get the gospel out. We send and we preach, they hear and they believe and salvation happens by God's grace Um, but there must be that receiving of the word John writes uh, we must receive it as the word of God and not a man John writes this in John 1 12 to all who did receive him as being Christ who believed his name he gave the right to become children of God it's not automatic just because you're born in a Christian family doesn't mean you're automatically a follower of Jesus right there's that moment in time when you receive this as yours right and, you know, like this, this is what happened to me. I was, I mean, I was, a, I was a kid, like six or seven years old. I was blessed to be raised in a Christian home. My dad was a deacon, like forever. Um, I think he's in Acts chapter six is one of the originals. I don't know. But <clears throat> anyway, he was a deacon a long time. And so I heard, heard about Jesus all growing up. I was always at church, all this stuff, right? Then one night we're having this thing called a revival, right? Where every night a preacher came in for like two weeks. And one night in there listening, I actually was listening. It's really weird for a kid that young to be listening, but I was listening. And the preacher said this, and he, you know, back in those days, they were fired. They were like spitting, you know, and I was, I was sitting right there because my dad couldn't hear. So I'm sitting right beside my dad. And this preacher, just because you're growing up in a Christian home does not mean you're a Christian. I was like, that's some crazy stuff, right? And so I went home that night and was asking my brother about that. What did he mean by that? I mean, I'm not a Christian. And so my brother shared the gospel with me. But it had to be a moment in time where I received it myself as mine, right? There's got to be that moment in time that happened in Michaela's life. That's why she got baptized, right? Because when you believe, then your next step is to get baptized. And so there's that we have to receive the gospel in that moment in time. And, um, and then we see that the gospel does a work in us. The word does a work in us. So he says re- they received it. Um, you heard from us, you accepted not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. The word of God does its work, works in us, right? I mean, Philippians says this, for it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Um, we call that God changes your want to. His desires start becoming your desires. It's just, there's a transformation, there's a change that takes place. And God tells us this, Isaiah 55, my words that goes from my mouth, they will not return to me empty or void, but they will accomplish that which I propose and and it will succeed in the thing for which I've sent it. So when you're truly saved, right? When you're truly born again, following Jesus, the word of God gets in you, the Holy Spirit is in you and there's gonna be work done. You're gonna see some change. If you've been saying that you're a Christian for all these years, right? And you look back and you can't see any change. There's never been a change of desires. There's never been a a growing love for the Lord. And as we're talking about, there's never gonna be, there never was a growing love for God's people and God's mission, you know? It's not my call whether that's legitimate or not, but that should raise a flag in your mind. Mate, what's going on here, right? Because the genuine biblical salvation, right? is a process. Yes, you're saved, you're justified, you're born again, but then there's this process that begins. The word of God does a work in you to change you. Your worldview should change some, right? Romans 12 says, don't be conformed anymore to the patterns of this world, but be renewed, be transformed rather by the renewing of your mind. That's a process, it's change that happens. 
And it's got to happen because the word does its work. And so the result here for the church in Thessalonica and should be for us is the received word does not work in us and that results in us imitating exemplary churches and also exempl- and imitating Jesus. We looked at imitation last week, but here, if you skip on down kind of the end of our text, um, it says here in verse um, 14, for you brothers became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea. That's just what happens. Because the Holy Spirit's growing us to be like him. And the more we become like the Holy Spirit and they become more like the Holy Spirit, the more we're going to be like each other, right? Because we're growing in the image of Jesus. Third, we please God. We deeply savor our partnership with one another. Our partnership with one another. <clears throat> so here the word used for partnership is, is sometimes translated fellowship. It's a Greek word koinonia. But the fellowship, I don't know, it's kind of a, fellowship can become kind of a watered down term in our American church context. When I think of fellowship, when you think of fellowship, what do you think of? Food, I heard it, food, that's right, right? Yep, that's the old Baptist law where two or three are gathered together, there shall be some chicken, you know, it's just the way it goes, right? Um, and, and that's not a bad thing, right? And it includes fellowship, it includes hanging out and friendships and all that, but it's more than that. It is partnership. It's us locking arms together for a common purpose, a common mission. So if you look at the way, like those of you that like to read and maybe you've read the Fellowship of the Ring, the Lord of the Rings trilogy by Tolkien, right? The first one is the Fellowship of the Ring. You had a different races come together, dwarf and elf and human, whatever, right? But they came together for the common purpose, the common mission of getting this ring to where it needed to go. That was their mission. So they were a fellowship, a partnership, locking arms for that goal, for that purpose. And so when you think in, in those sort of terms, there's this partnership. And in that partnership, they needed each other. They needed desire in each other, right? And so we see the first thing here is we grow in our desire to be with each other. Here's what Paul says. This is an interesting phrase here, verse eight. So being affectionately desirous of you, right? And how many of us even talk like that anymore, right? The NIV says, being deeply, no, loving you very deeply. It's a, it's a good paraphrase, right? Loving you very deeply. There was a genuine love within this church that Paul's talking about, affectionately desiring. And so what we see, we see this is built on this fellowship that we have, this partnership with each other. John describes it like this in his letter. So that which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you. That's the gospel the person of Jesus, so that you too may have what? Fellowship, partnership with us. And indeed our fellowship partnership is with the Father and with his son, Jesus Christ. Also verse four says, um, we're writing to you so that your joy may be complete. So notice that our joy, our completion of our joy is connected to our partnering together and our partnering with Jesus. Without the partnership with Jesus, without the partnership with other believers, you're not going to have that completeness of joy. You might think all I need is, all I need is God in my fishing boat. And I'm good, right? Or all I need is God in my driver, right? And I'm good. Hey, that's fun. That's good. But no, we need each other. We need each other. That's what God has made us. Our joy depends on it. Or the completion of that joy depends on it. And so John goes on to says this, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So there's that joy, that togetherness, that partnership that happens. If you're really in the light, you have that partnership, right? So the church becomes very dear to us. As we seek to honor the Lord through holiness, we savor these partnerships. We love them. We love each other, right? The church becomes very dear to us. I love how John later says this. This is really clear. We know. This is a statement of certainty, right? We know that we have passed from death to life because why? We have love for the brothers. Love in the family of God, right? That just happens. I remember um, we had a gentleman who used to go here for years, great fellow named Wayman. 
Wayman Starnes, passed away a couple years ago, but Wayman got saved at the age of 40. And uh, he thought he was a believer before that, but man, he, he really got on fire for the Lord. He truly got born again. But it was funny. He tells a story that he came to church one Sunday night with his wife <clears throat> and not a believer, goes home, you know, didn't have a good time. But that week, you know, the Lord saved him. He heard the gospel and gave his life to Jesus. He came back to church that Wednesday night. He loved it. He stood up at the end of the service and says, I don't know what happened to y'all. Sunday night, I didn't like any of you. But tonight, I love every one of you, right? <laughs> what happened? Did the whole church just change in three days? No, Wayman did, right? And so that's an evidence of what really happened in his life. There became a genuine love. And if you ever met Wayman, so you didn't know him, he truly loved the people of God, right? Just a, a godly fella. But that is such a true verse. It's a litmus test of the genuineness of our faith is this partnership that we really enjoy, that we really need, because it all leads to this point of we have a familial relationship. Brothers and sisters, and here Paul talks, we came to you like fathers, we came to you like mothers, as our dear children, nursing infants. And he uses all, these, all this family language. You know, we're, we're family. Just turn to your neighbor and say, hey, we are family. Some of you are biologically family, you just said that too. And that's true, obviously, but we are family of God. We are family. And so here we, we get to verse 12 and there's some key terms used here. It's really powerful. So verse 11, for you know how, like a father with his children, we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you. So we're gonna look at those three terms and we're gonna close. Exhorted, it's an interesting word. And the Greek is the, it's the word we get our word paraclete from. And John's gospel, this is the same term used to talk about the Holy Spirit, our comforter, our, paric our counselor, our paraclete. And what this word literally means, you break the word apart, parakaleo, it's two Greek words mashed together. Kaleo means to call, para means beside. So I'm gonna call you along beside myself. I'm gonna come alongside you, put my arm around you. And this word exhort means I'm gonna put my arm around you and walk beside you so that I can help you walk the right direction. So it's kind of, let me just put my arm around you and kind of tweak you a little bit and take you this way. You're gonna walk with me. I'm walking with you in the right direction. So there's this exhortation to call you to come alongside of, right? That's what we're to do with each other. So the, one of the purposes of the church, that's why Paul says like, I'm like a father and you're like my children. I'm gonna exhort you. But then the word is encourage. It's a little bit different word. It means to come alongside of, but, but not to turn them to walk with you. It's I'm coming alongside to walk with you and what you're going through, right? I'm encouraging you to walk through something that's tough or I'm coming alongside you to celebrate what you good things you got going on. And it's interesting, Paul also elsewhere talks about like Romans 12. When one rejoices, we all rejoice. When one mourns, we all mourn. Here's the big point. You're never supposed to be alone, right? You're never supposed to go through anything good or bad alone. When you have something great in your life, God has set this up to where you have this family to celebrate with you, right? So when you have a major victory, whether it's like a big birthday or whether it's, you know, getting married or having a baby or, or having your first grandbaby, right? It's a month away, woo right? Whatever it is, you have people to celebrate with you, to come alongside and say, man, that's, I'm, just, I'm there with you, you know? But then when you have death in the family, or when you lose your job, or when life just happens, you know, that's if someone will come alongside, put their arm around you. I'm, I'm hurting with you. My heart hurts with you. I'm going to walk beside you through this. You know, if you look at the military. Guys and gals go to combat together. They're just connected, right, in such a powerful way. Why? Because they were right there, linked arms, arm in arm together, going through some pretty horrific stuff. It just builds a bond. That's the way we're designed is the body of Christ. We're familial. We're family. Brothers and sisters. You know, so we're exhorted. We're encouraged. And then lastly, we're, called, we're charged. Charged to walk in a manner worthy of God. You're charged to live out 
the holiness that Christ has put into your account. To let what you say and what you live match. This thing that you've been called, according to this, you have been, um, what was the word that Paul used? Approved. You have been approved and entrusted with the gospel. God loves you. God is. We looked at last week. God has chosen you, right? Live that out. Be the person God has created you to be. Live out this incredible life God has blessed you with. You have eternity life, eternal life, so live like it. You're completely forgiven, so live like it. You have the righteousness of Jesus in your account. So live like it. I mean, it's like this. Here's what Jesus has done for us. It's like this. Let's say, and this is probably pretty real for a lot of you, a lot of us. You got mortgage. And let's say it's, oh, let's say you got a really not $300,000 mortgage. Let's say you got student loans. You got a car payment. Maybe some credit card debt on the side. That's a lot of debt. It's going to take you forever to pay all that off, right? So Jesus comes along, so, or someone comes along, and say, you know what, I'm going to take all your debt. I got it. I got you. But then they don't stop there. Now they're going to say, I'm going to credit you with more money than you can even imagine. Billions in your account. Is that going to change how you live a little bit? Maybe just a little bit. And yet what we're talking about is not money. We're talking about life. We're talking about eternity. We're talking about forgiveness, mercy, grace. We're talking about love, right? That's what Jesus has done for us. We have placed our faith and trust in him. So what do we do with that, right? Well, first... If you've never trusted in Christ, if you've never come to Jesus in faith and commit your life to him like Michaela has, and so, many others, so many others here, that's your next step is I want, to give, I want to commit my life to Jesus. I want to follow Jesus. If you have done that, it's easy for us to, you know, let our actions drift from what we say we believe. It's easy for us to start to elevate and value things that just aren't as valuable as the kingdom or as the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so what happens is, is kind of as we elevate these things, entertainment, hobbies, you know, even careers to the, ex to the expense of Jesus and the gospel, we kind of get out of whack and off kilter. And God's just got a way about how he does things. Like a message like this, or you hear a podcast, or you're just reading in the Bible and God just grabs your heart and says, hey, what is this all about? Is this about you? No, it's about me. It's all about God. That's just a built-in way God just kind of keeps us back in check, you know, through his spirit, convicts us. He continues to change us. We're all in that process. It happens to all of us, right? So maybe today that's you. you I got to get back to making it all about God. And what if every husband and wife made their marriage about God? What if every parent made their parenting and their kids about God? What if all of us in our careers made our career all about Jesus? What if we made where we got a house all about Jesus? I mean, that just keeps going. That, that changes how we live, right? It's worldview, how we live, how we see things, how we discern things. So what is your next step today? Let's all stand. We're going to pray. Close at our time together. Am I walking in a manner worthy of what Jesus has done for me? I remember the movie Saving Private Ryan. I don't know if you ever saw it. I hope you saw the TV version. But man, at the end of the movie, these, these soldiers. Private Ryan was the last of like five brothers to survive World War II. He's still alive, fighting somewhere in Europe. They sent this whole team to find him. And this whole team, except for one or two, got killed in the process. And 
Bob Ryan got, he, they found him, they rescued him, brought him back. And years later, he's, he's back at the, the memorial there in France at Normandy. He's looking at the tombstones of all these guys that, that lost their life trying to save him. He's weeping. He turns to his wife and he says, just tell me I'm worth it. He was asking the same question that we're charged to ask today. Am I living my life in a manner worthy of what Jesus has done for me? Let the Lord lead you to answer that question for you as you contemplate your next steps. Let's pray. Jesus, we love you. But thank you for loving us first. Thank you for coming and giving your life as an atoning sacrifice for us. Thank you for taking our sin, becoming our sin and our shame. Thank you for crediting us with your righteousness so that now through faith, through faith alone, as we read earlier, as we sang out of Ephesians 2, by grace we're saved through faith. This is not of ourselves. It's your gift, not by our work so that none of us can boast. We can be saved through faith today. So I pray for anyone here or watching online, if they've never trusted you, that Lord, today is that day. Because there's eternity at stake. Heaven and hell are real and they weigh in the balance. So Lord, I just pray that your spirit is just talking to all of us about how much you love us. How much you've committed to us. And you want us to be part of your family. The Lord, save those who are here who are not saved yet. We've got to also pray for those who have just gotten distracted, have gotten in a little off into thinking and forgetting that it's really all about you. So God, we all just need this reminders and in your kindness, you extend them just to correct our direction. And God, maybe for some, the next step is to join the church family or commit to getting baptized uh, like Michaela just to honor you. So God, whatever our next step is, I just pray to hear this morning, you make that clear. And God, you would also give us the faith, courage to take action on that step. Lord, we love you. Commit our time to you in Jesus' name. Amen.